Before we begin this episode, I would like to remind you that True Crime Fan Club Prime has premiered on Patreon. For just $10 a month, you can hear cases that I wouldn't normally cover on the main show. TCFC Prime is driven by what patrons want to hear. I covered the case of James Bird Jr. for the first episode. The next episode is coming soon. If you're interested in hearing more content from me, head to patreon.com slash tcfcpod. Explicit content is found in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. David Westerfield and the Van Dam family lived in the same upper-scale neighborhood of Saber Springs in Northeast San Diego, California. In fact, they only lived several houses apart. On February 1st, 2002, these neighbors would become connected forever in the most brutal and awful of ways. David Westerfield abducted Damon and Brenda Van Dam's little girl, seven-year-old Danielle Van Dam, from her very own bed and would murder her. It would take nearly 30 days before her severely decomposed body would be located some 150 miles away from the home she was taken from. Okay, on to the show. Damon and Brenda Van Dam met and quickly fell in love. They married and went on to have three children together, Derek, Danielle, and Dylan. They lived a comfortable but busy life with their children. They had an unconventional lifestyle and liked to let loose and have a good time. Friday, February 1st, 2002, started out like any other day for the Van Dam family. After a long day of work, Brenda and some of her girlfriends had planned to go out and do some drinking and dancing. They all met up at the Van Dam home, where they did a little pre-drinking and smoked a joint before heading out to the local bar. This same very night, David Westerfield happened to be at the same bar where he encountered Brenda and her friends. The women were dancing and having a good time. They went outside several times to smoke a joint, but they would come right back inside to continue dancing and drinking. The women stayed late because they were having a good time and letting loose a bit. David would later claim to the police that he danced with Brenda at the bar. Though a few witnesses corroborated this account, Brenda was adamant that she did not dance with him. In fact, she and her friends even had a few laughs at David's expense that night, though they would all later describe him as being creepy. The women weren't against a few free drinks, but none of them were dancing or otherwise engaged with any men at the bar that night. After closing time, they found her husband Damon fast asleep on the couch. He woke up when the slightly tipsy women came back into the house. The six of them all sat in the kitchen and talked a bit before they decided to call it a night. Damon and Brenda decided it was time for bed, so they turned in assuming that this night was like any other night where their daughter, Danielle, was peacefully sleeping in her bed. When they woke up the next morning, they discovered what no parent could ever imagine. Their little girl was missing from her bed. In a panic, the couple frantically searched the house. When they found no trace of Danielle anywhere, they called 911. It was 9.39 a.m. on Saturday, February 2nd, 2002. Police responded right away. This was a small community, and things like this just didn't happen here. Search parties quickly organized, and a headquarters of sorts was established. They called it the Danielle Recovery Center. Police immediately began canvassing the neighborhood for any signs of Danielle or clues as to where she might be. There were a few neighbors that weren't home, but the police kept pounding on doors until they spoke with someone. The community came out in droves, and search parties were combing all of the nearby neighborhoods and before long, the whole area was being searched. The police came across the home of David Westerfield, but he wasn't at the residence at the time. David Allen Westerfield 
was born in San Diego, California on February 25th, 1952. He went to school to study engineering and would eventually become a very successful engineer. He married and divorced, but the marriage did produce two sons. David owned a very nice home, several RVs, and a motorhome. He enjoyed fishing and camping and often took trips with his son when he was younger. Despite his financial success and independence, David didn't have much luck with women and frequently hung out at the local bar where patrons who encountered him found him to be odd. The Monday after Danielle went missing, David returned home around 8 o'clock a.m. in his SUV and was almost immediately questioned by police. They were suspicious right away when he returned from an alleged camping trip but couldn't describe his route or where he went. They also noticed that his motorhome had already been cleaned. They asked David to come in for questioning, and he did. He told police that he knew of the little girl and, in fact, the whole family because they were neighbors. He also told them that he had seen Brenda the Friday before at the bar with some of her friends. He said they had danced together and he offered to buy the group a drink. He went on to tell police that he and his son were avid campers and fishermen and he had decided to take a solo camping trip the morning of Danielle's disappearance. Again, he was unable to articulate which route he had taken on this trip. He couldn't explain where he had gone and was vague with details. Investigators quickly suspected he was lying and worked to secure a search warrant for his motorhomes and house. David was considered the main suspect at this point, and they began constant surveillance on him. They interviewed David's son, witnesses from the bar, and any other witness they could locate. A search warrant for his house was executed, and the motorhome was brought into the police lab for forensic testing. Clothing and other items were taken from his home for testing and evidence collection. The home computer was seized, and the police were beyond disturbed to find thousands of pornographic images, as well as a video depicting the rape of a young girl by two older men. The images and video were extremely graphic and showed children being tortured. At this point, the police were certain they had their man as the evidence continued to pile up. Blood was located in the motorhome, and testing determined the blood to belong to Danielle. Police were also led to a laundromat, where they interviewed an employee that described David coming in, barefoot, to drop off a comforter for a dry cleaning. The police had enough evidence now, and David was arrested on February 22, 2002. He was charged with the kidnapping and murder of Danielle Van Dam. As soon as David's name was released to the public, search parties really ramped up their efforts to find Danielle. Search areas were greatly enlarged. A search party put together by the Laura Recovery Center was out searching and followed a different route away from Sabre Springs toward more remote parts of the Imperial County Desert. They were nearly 150 miles from her home when the naked and severely decomposed body of Danielle Van Dam was finally found. It was February 27th, nearly 30 days after she went missing. She was found in a very remote area off Dehesa Road, near the Sequan Indian Reservation. It was a devastating discovery. But at least now, the family may find out the answers about what happened to their beloved daughter. Police investigated near the area where her body was found and were able to locate a few witnesses who encountered David along his road trip. His strange behavior was noted, and those witnesses would later be called to testify during his trial. On June 4th, 2002, David Westerfield went to trial for the kidnapping and murder of Danielle Van Dam. His defense was that he had absolutely nothing to do with it, and police had the wrong guy. He continued to deny any involvement in Danielle's disappearance or murder. Prosecutors informed the jury that they would show plenty of evidence, including circumstantial, forensic, and DNA evidence that would prove beyond a reasonable doubt that David did in fact murder Danielle. Many witnesses were called by the prosecution, including a tow truck driver named Dan Conklin, 
who towed David's motorhome from a ditch on Super Bowl Sunday, February 3rd. A couple had passed David's motorhome stuck deep into a ditch and reported it. Mr. Conklin stated that he went to assist in pulling the motorhome from the ditch. He said he had believed the two were alone, but when he was trying to attach a tow chain, he heard what he thought was a voice saying something. He went around the motorhome to ask what David was saying, and David said either, I wasn't talking to you, or I didn't say anything. He said that David seemed very agitated and was in a hurry to get pulled out. Once the motorhome was completely pulled from the ditch, David hopped in and sped off. Forensic experts testified about the blood that was found in the motorhome and on the comforter that was determined to belong to Danielle. They also testified to fibers from Danielle's bedroom, located inside the motorhome. David's son, Neil Westerfield, was also called by the prosecution to testify against his own dad. He admitted on the stand that he didn't want to be there, but was forced under subpoena by the prosecutor. Neil was there to testify about pornographic images and videos that were located on David's computer. David had tried to tell police that all of the evidence found on the computer actually belonged to his son, Neil. Neil told the jury that he did not have anything to do with the things found on his dad's computer. He said he was only into looking at pictures of large breasts and not children, and in fact, had never even searched for pornography on his dad's home computer. He adamantly denied having anything to do with the pictures and videos police found. He continued to testify about his relationship with his dad and that they enjoyed camping and fishing and frequently took trips together. He said that they had never before taken the route that his dad took the weekend of Danielle's disappearance and that his dad rarely went camping without him. Prosecutors had several experts testify about blood and other forensic evidence. There was expert testimony from several entomologists or bug experts. An entomologist can testify to the time a body has been out in the elements based on bug larvae and infestation on a body. The entomologist's testimony was one of the biggest focuses of the trial. The defense team presented three entomologists and the prosecution presented one. The prosecution's entomologist, Dr. Madison Lee Goff, testified that she believed Danielle's body was likely placed in the desert between February 9th and 14th, but she further stated that many factors, such as weather, could delay the infestation. The pornographic images and video were also shown to the jury at the trial, and despite David initially blaming the nearly 10,000 nude images on his son Neil, he would later say that the photos were actually for his own enjoyment, and the nearly 80 or so child pornography images and videos he meant to send to the U.S. Congress to show them what kind of smut could be found on the internet. When David's defense team had their chance to present, They incredibly called the Van Dam's parenting into question. They questioned Brenda on direct examination about the activities of her and her girlfriends the night of Danielle's disappearance. They seemed to suggest that Brenda and her friends were somehow negligent because they were drinking and smoking marijuana. They also suggested that Damon was negligent because he was home and didn't notice someone enter their home and take his daughter. Damon testified that he usually locked the doors at night, but he fell asleep on the couch that night, much like any parent could have done. The defense made accusations that the lifestyle the Van Dams led probably brought a monster into their home. He talked about their sexual habits and characterized Brenda as a partier whose lifestyle included drinking, smoking marijuana, going out, and changing sexual partners. Brenda's friend from that evening, Denise Kimmel, also testified to seeing David that night at the bar. She recalled the women thinking he was creepy because he was just sitting there staring at them. She admitted that the women had all smoked marijuana several times throughout the night, and she began to cry when recalling seeing the red light on the home alarm, which usually meant the door was open somewhere in the house. When the group searched the house, they saw a door in the garage was sitting wide open, and Denise tearfully said that she forgot to lock the door behind her when they came back in from smoking a joint before going out that night. 
The defense attorney made a point to ask her why she failed to mention that she had a sexual relationship with both Damon and Brenda Van Dam. Denise said it wasn't like that, but more like a wife swap, where she slept with Damon and Brenda slept with her husband. She said she didn't mention it before because it didn't happen that night, so she thought it was irrelevant to Danielle's kidnapping and murder. As mentioned before, the defense also presented entomologist expert testimony. They actually called three different experts, David Faulkner, Neil Haskell, and Dr. Robert Hall. Dr. Robert Hall testified to when he thought Danielle's body was placed in the desert. He estimated flies first laid eggs on the body in mid-February and the insect infestation began between February 12th and 23rd. The defense argued that this was long after David had come under police suspicion and was under 24-hour surveillance. All of the defense experts, presented by David's attorney, agreed that evidence seemed to indicate that the body was placed in the desert in mid-February, which was after police had already started investigating him. From the time Danielle went missing in February to when the trial concluded was a mere six months, which in the legal world is extremely fast. But the trial lasted for two long months, which was excruciating for the Van Dam family. They were forced to sit through trial testimony for all that time, listening to the awful details of their daughter's death, all while being accused of being negligent parents at best and outright terrible parents at worst. Brenda Van Dam was basically put on trial herself because of what the defense deemed inappropriate behaviors, none of which actually contributed to the death of her little girl. The family should have been able to mourn their daughter's death in peace. The jury deliberated for 40 hours, which was 10 long days. Everyone thought it would be much quicker, but after much deliberation, they returned with a verdict of guilty of kidnapping and murder. I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsor. Despite a speedy trial preparation, the defense requested additional time to prepare for the penalty and sentencing phase of the trial, stating they weren't quite ready for this portion. The penalty and sentencing phase was set to begin in August of 2002, but was delayed to November 22, 2002. Before they adjourned, the defense had the gall to suggest that the prosecution settle for a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole because a death sentence would mean an automatic and lengthy appeals process. The defense would rather spare the Van Dam family any more pain and sadness than they have already suffered. Obviously, the prosecutors and the Van Dam family weren't having any of it and rejected the defense's request and asked to proceed with the penalty and sentencing phase. The judge would make the final decision and deliver the ultimate sentence after hearing all of the additional evidence. During the penalty phase at David's trial, Brenda Van Dam spoke about her daughter and how wonderful she already was even at such a young age. Damon Van Dam echoed the same sentiments and lamented about missing the chance to see his little girl grow up and how he would never get to walk her down the aisle to get married. Without Danielle... They were all devastated, and their family wouldn't be the same without her. She had two brothers that missed her so much, and they all missed her pretty, shining smile. David's niece also testified during this phase and told about a time when she was young. She had woken up to her uncle, strangely fondling her teeth. While the defense asked for leniency, Superior Court Judge William Mudd worked his way through an 11-point list of factors that could work for or against the defendant. He noted that the little girl was abducted from her own bed and her poor body was found naked, decomposed, and showed evidence of severe trauma. These things were considered mitigating factors 
that weighed heavily against the defendant. Because of all of this, the judge chose to agree with the jury recommendation of death rather than life in prison without parole. In January 2003, David Westerfield was officially sentenced to death. After the trial, much of the police evidence was released to the media, and that included the taped interrogation of David, where he admitted to being emotionally unstable, but continued to deny his involvement in Danielle's death. It was also revealed that the prosecutors were just about to sign a plea agreement with David when Danielle's body was found. At that point, it was decided that David was going to be tried no matter what. After the sentencing hearing, Gloria Allred, a legal activist, held a press conference saying that she would be working with the Van Dam family to get a law through Congress called Danielle's Law. Danielle's Law would make a death penalty special circumstance if a child is killed in their own home. The reason for this need is because David's lawyers tried arguing during the sentencing phase that he wasn't eligible for the death penalty because Danielle was actually killed in her own bed, and therefore, she was not kidnapped. This was seemingly a loophole in the system that Danielle's family wanted to see corrected so no family would have to suffer because of it. Nearly 10 years after being sentenced to death, David was still appealing his conviction and sentence in the California Supreme Court. His attorney cited nearly 30 mistakes that they say were made during his investigation and trial. This included his nine-hour interrogation with police, where David complained of being tired and thirsty. Brenda Van Dam was interviewed by news media at one of the appeal hearings and talked about how hard this had been for her family. The Van Dam family attorney, Spencer Busby, was interviewed after one appeal hearing and he was noted to say that the appeal was all part of the legal process, but that he truly didn't believe that the conviction would be overturned. David Westerfield didn't win his appeal. In fact, it was just in February of 2019 that the California Supreme Court upheld the conviction and David Westerfield remains on death row in California San Quentin Prison. Currently in the state of California, the death penalty is in legislation to be abolished. The current governor, Gavin Newsom, has supported the abolishment and therefore, there will be no death sentences carried out for the duration of his term. No death row inmate in California has been executed since 2006. Voters will likely decide this issue sometime in 2020. Shortly after the criminal trial, the Van Dam family filed a wrongful death civil suit against David Westerfield and his estate. David owned several motorhomes, RVs, and his property. He earned nearly $170,000 per year as a self-employed engineer. He liquidated his assets before his trial to pay for his legal defense team. So while the Van Dams actually won the civil suit, they will never see a dime from David or his estate. However, the suit does prevent David from profiting from his story or writing a book for profits. His last possession was a Rolex watch, but the Van Dams managed to persuade the judge to allow them to keep the watch. The insurance company for David's motorhome was also sued and ordered to pay $400,000 to $1 million in restitution to the Van Dam family. While none of it can ever bring Danielle back again, These are small things that will help Danielle's brothers in their future and helps the family find some semblance of closure. Brenda and Damon tried to visit David in prison. They wanted to ask him why he did this, and Brenda said she just wanted to know why her little girl had to die just to fulfill his sick fantasies. But in taking the advice of his attorney, David refused to speak to them. If he is ever to receive the death penalty, the entire Van Dam family would be able to witness the execution. It was only one week after Danielle's disappearance and murder that their family was supposed to be taking a trip to Italy. In fact, Danielle's passport photo was used in her missing posters. This was a trip that the family would obviously never take, but it would have likely brought many wonderful family memories to them. 
Danielle, was born on September 22, 1994, in my hometown of Plano, Texas. She was a very healthy baby, weighing 10 pounds and 15 ounces when she was born. Danielle is survived by her parents, Damon and Brenda, and her older brother Derek and younger brother Dylan. Her favorite colors were pink and purple, and she loved ballet and gymnastics. She was a Girl Scout and avid journalist. She loved playing with her friends and brothers, and her family says that she was taught to respect others as she wanted to be respected. She was described as a very special person who truly cared about the feelings of others. Sadly, the Girl Scouts she loved so much was likely the very thing that brought her into David Westerfield's world, as only three days before her kidnapping, she was inside David's home with her mom to sell him Girl Scout cookies. On July 2nd, 2003, the Van Dam family was successful in getting a highway overpass in El Cajon, California, named after Danielle. The overpass on State Highway Route 8 at 2nd Street was designated as a Danielle Van Dam Memorial Overpass. The official ribbon cutting ceremony took place, and the overpass will forever remain a tribute to the little girl taken from her family and this world far too soon. This episode of True Crime Fan Club Podcast was researched by Brittany Martinez and written by Mari Cole. I'm your host, Lainey. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help us out. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFC Pod, Facebook.com slash TCFC Podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, TCFC underscore podcast. And of course, our website is truecrimefanclub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. Audio engineering and custom music for the show was provided by the talented Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Check him out on Twitter at wetalkofdreams. Content warning at the top of the show was provided by Tyler Allen, host of the Minds of Madness podcast. 